Uh, welcome to the July session of the Silicon Valley Computer Genealogy Group. Um, we'll begin this meeting this morning by having an invocation, as is our practice. I invited Alan Kingsbury, our past president, to that for us. Thank you, Alan. Once again, I'd like to express appreciation to those who worked hard to make our organization continue. Um, we're coming up on 25 years that we've been organized, and uh, it's been a long time, but I, I believe there's only been one Saturday, one month, outside of the normal Decembers when we don't meet this normal that we miss in that 25 years. We've been here every single second Saturday. And uh, that takes a lot of planning and, and work and dedication from those on, on the board who work to do that. And also, thank, we give to our thanks to the LDS Church for making that facility available to us. Um, as I've announced before, we are not affiliated with the LDS Church in any way. But uh, they are kind enough to allow us to use their facility and make it possible for us to have this a great opportunity. A couple of announcements that I'd like to make. First of all, uh, when the blurb went out, the, the little email blurb went out this last week, uh, and now I'm reminding you of this meeting, there was a notice in it about our fall seminar that will be held on the 9th of November, not the 11th, as was stated in the message. Uh, there's a confusion over what day is is Veterans Day and what day we meet, but we meet on the Saturday, not on the Monday. So our fall seminar with uh, uh, Brian McGraw, who is the director of the National Archives in St. Louis, the Military Personnel Records Center. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have him uh, come. He has been given, in, in spite of sequestration, he's been granted the privilege of coming as long as Congress doesn't do anything worse <laughs> to make it so he can't come. But uh, so he will be here. We are also planning, uh, and the reason why we're pretty excited about this is that, um, as you all recall, the, the military records facility in St. Louis had a terrible fire a number of years ago. And uh, many of the military rec service records for both the First World War and the Second World War were destroyed. And uh, destroyed means that they were involved in a fire, which typically means that in a case where you've got a lot of papers stacked in boxes, they're singed around the edges. The fire can't get into the center of the box because of all the, the lack of oxygen. So most of those records were not totally destroyed. They were singed around the edge. However, they poured some 600,000 gallons of water on the facility to uh, put out the fire. And all of that water was soaked into the middle of the boxes. So they are in the process now of recovering all of that material by peeling off each individual record, treating it with, uh, a, I believe they could uh, glycerin with it to, so that it doesn't dry out and become brittle. And one by one, they are rearranging, re putting together all the, the pieces of the paper and trying to make as many of those military records available to those of uh, you who served in the military during that time and their descendants. So it's an exciting project, and we're really happy to have him come, have Brian come and explain to us that process and to help us understand how we can uh, access those records as they become available. We are also planning to have someone who is really adept at using Fold3, which is the website uh, 
dedicated to providing many of the records from the National Archives, especially the military records, available to us. Uh, they have a website that's a little bit difficult for people to follow, and uh, the search engine is a little tricky, and so we're going to have someone come at that time as well to uh, take us through the ins and outs of, of Fold 3, uh, that website. So that will be November 9th here. Uh, our normal time will be a, a, a day-long seminar uh, running from 9 o'clock on well into 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And then we'll go on. Are there any questions about that? So ignore the message that gave you this week. We'll try and avoid that in the future, but that'll be November 9th. And uh, pretty excited about it. Uh, a couple of other changes that I'd like to make sure that you're aware of. First of all, um, it was announced this last. Uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago at a, at a regional meeting that I attended, that the Athena Regional Online Catalog for all of the family history centers in the Bay Area is being forced to retire. Uh, the product, Athena, is, a, is an online catalog where we have literally cataloged all of the holdings of all of the family history centers in the Bay Area, making it possible for you to search to see if anything that you're interested in is available anywhere in the Bay Area rather than having to order it or go to Salt Lake and, and so on. Unfortunately, that software, which we funded many years ago as a group, um, has been sold to uh, on two occasions now, and the new owner of Athena has decided not to make it available on the latest versions of Windows. So it's still running on an old Windows server over in at the Oakland Family History Center, but they can't keep that thing running forever. So in casting about for a solution to a, a, an appropriate cataloging system that we could use for this, they, they ran into some real snags with some of the products that are on the market today. So they decided to ask Salt Lake City what they would suggest. And Salt Lake City said, well, we'll put it on our catalog for you. So uh, they have agreed to put the holdings of all of the family history centers in the Bay Area on the FamilySearch.org catalog system. And we will be the only region in the country that they'll do that for. Uh, just, and it's primarily because we have the Athena system, which is, is based on the same underlying cataloging system that the, the Salt Lake version is. So our holdings will be available at the family history at, at familysearch.org in the catalog system. But that's going to take a little bit of time to happen. So don't go there right now. And uh, we've, we've been demoed the, the website where it'll work. We can see that it's all set up and ready to go, but now it's going to take crash and going. And all of those of us who are directors of family history centers have to go in and make sure that our catalogs are correct. So that when people in Switzerland see our catalog and want to have us do some research on our in our holdings report, it'll be correct. So, so anyway, um, that's one announcement. Another change that uh, has been a little bit of a frustration for me, and then for us, in fact, is that the uh, the the indexing project, the indexing team, has decided that all LDS people, members of the Mormon Church, who are indexing, should be doing indexing for their local congregation. So all of the LDS people in our indexing team were taken off of our team and reassigned to their local congregation. So we lost about half of our indexers. Uh, fortunately, they weren't the most active ones. So, um, but and, and when I complained to them, they said, well, have them log in and create an alternative login that's not LDS, and then they can do indexing for the Silicon Valley computer genealogy. So if you are LDS and you would prefer to have your, your statistics, your credits for your indexing, go to the Silicon Valley genealogy team rather than your local state team, then you need to create a new registration as a non-LDS person 
and then let me know and I'll move you into our team again. Is that clear? Next time. Um, they know that I'm not happy about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, we our, our indexing stat still continues to grow. In June, we get 13,944 names in our indexing project. So that brings to uh, our total since the beginning of indexing 1,755,273 names indexed by our team. So we're, we're happy about that. Okay, um, other groups in the area, Santa Clara County Historical and Genealogical Society will be having their monthly meeting this coming Tuesday on the 16th at 6 p.m. And they're talking on Mapping Madness. They have Ron Aarons, who is on the staff there at the library. He will discuss a variety of websites for finding historical maps. And then he's going to talk about the basics of Microsoft Maps and Google Maps and uh, discuss their features side by side and which one uh, he thinks is better and, and so on. Uh, so that will be Tuesday at the Heritage, at the uh, Homestead Central Park Library just down the street here uh, a ways uh, in their, uh, I think they, what's the room that they meet in? The Sequoia Room, I believe. Is that right? Cedar Room, that's right, the Cedar Room. As you go in the front door of the library, it's off to the left. Okay. The San Mateo County Genealogical Society will have their meeting next Saturday on the 20th at 10.30. And their topic is Find My Past versus Ancestry.com. Uh, the speakers will be a collection of people who are experienced in using either of those two sites. Ancestry.com and Find My Path, and they will uh, compare and show the strengths and weaknesses of each one, and so on. Okay, I'd also like to invite uh, any of you who are offering classes in the fall through various organizations uh, for the general public on doing uh, uh, genealogy classes, so on, to adult continuing education, and so on to stand and tell us what they are so that those of you who might be interested in that. Pam, would you like to stand and talk to me? Okay. Two locations in San Jose. You can tell us where they are. class from Pam and she's an excellent teacher. She's been doing this for how long? Okay. So that'll give you an idea of her. Yes. And that's on right. It's on the as you turn on to Brian from university from going Board 101 is on the left hand side of the street. It's a fairly sizable building there, right? Yeah. What oh, was that for height? Yeah, it's a nice lanai in the middle of it. And so on. Okay. Anyone else teach classes that you would like? Yes, Leslie. Oh, Leslie, yes. Wow. 
Okay? And can, can anyone get to those through the internet if they want to? Or they Okay. San Jose FHC. Oh, you have to spell it out. Okay. And Pam, do you have an announcement on the internet somewhere? Okay. Family Scribe. Which is Family Scribe. Family Scribe. Go to Alvinitas. Okay. Very good. Yes. Oh, that's true. Yes, we will post all of those on our website. So if you go to Silicon Valley, no, SB for Silicon Valley, CGG.org, we'll have links to all of those so that you can get the details. Okay. There's there's lots of lots of classes around available. Okay. Um Let's see. Do we have any family history moments? Oh, Brian, do you have something? Oh, that's true. Um, actually, there's an article in the in the newsletter when it comes that will explain a little bit about that. But um, the LDS Church has announced that they are no longer going to allow PATH the software path that they generated for many years to be downloaded from their website. Um, and they do not plan to have any support online or through the telephone, through the telephone support system for their, as of these days, what, the 13th, as of Monday. So the question has come up, what do those of you who use path need to do? Well, first of all, there's nothing wrong with continuing to use PATH. There's no enhancements being made to it, uh, but it's been around for so long, and it's been stable for so long, and there haven't been a lot of confusing bells and whistles added to it that makes it uh, susceptible to bugs and so on, that it's a very, very solid product. Uh, it does everything, in my opinion, that you need to do, uh, have to do managing your family history on, on a computer program. Uh, so consequently, uh, until uh, Microsoft changes Windows so much that it no longer runs, uh, it would be a satisfactory product to use. And, uh, if you're averse to having to learn a new piece of software, learn a whole new product, and, and so on, uh, I consider that to be a very good alternative to uh, having to buy a product and continue from there. Now, if there are reasons why you need to move on, for example, if you've switched over to a Macintosh, to the Mac world, or the dark side, um, uh, <laughs> um, then you will need then you will need to uh, find a solution and uh, we have been providing support for those solutions for a long time uh, we have the reunion group here that meets on a regular basis and we also have um, we also have uh, other products that are coming online I think we have a class today we will talk about in a minute uh, on one of those products. Uh, in that case, uh, if you are using a Mac, you will need to find a new product. Uh, if there are features in the products that are coming on, the commercial products such as Roots Magic, Legacy, Fem, Tree Maker, um, what have I left out? Roots Magic, Legacy, Family Tree Maker, oh, Ancestral Quest. If those products have features in them, bells and whistles, that PATH do not support, and you really feel the need to use those features, then uh, you will need to find a new product. And over the course of time, we will try to uh, provide training in those classes and, and uh, 
find out which ones people are choosing. Here come the newsletters. And those of you that need projectors, the projectors are there in the back. Um, so, uh, you would have to decide, you would have to decide, uh, look at those products. Each one of those products have a free several weeks trial period that you can download a, a, a version of the software that's hindered a little bit and then you can determine whether or not it's what you want to do or purchase. Most of them are running around the age of 30, uh, the price of 30 to 40 dollars until, until there's a major upgrade and then you have to buy the upgrade. So are there any questions about that? Uh, yes, Janet. Okay, so there, uh, Roots Magic, in order to try and capture some of that business, is offering a, a in, an inexpensive or slightly less expensive method of uh, upgrading from PATH directly to Roots Magic. Yes. Okay. okay. They're all trying to capture everybody's, all the PATH. There were several million people who registered with PATH. So it's a large contingency of people. And oh, yes, there is a free version uh, that, that's sort of a basic version of the product that. That file. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. So they're all buying for that uh, that new business. Yes. Well, if if you are well versed in PATH, you've been using PATH for a long time. Uh, ancestral Quest. Is going to be the one that most looks like PATH. And the reason for that is that when PATH was originally written for DOS and programming code for DOS, and when I, when Microsoft basically moved on to Windows and left DOS in the past, uh, the church was re, was in a position of having to rewrite PATH to run under Windows. Well, it turns out they didn't have the resources to do that. It was going to take a lot of time and energy and so on. So the fellow who, at the time, owned Ancestral Quest donated his code to the Mormon Church to replace PATH. It was a Windows product. So when they went from DOS to Windows, they literally switched over to a version, an, an earlier version of Ancestral Quest which has continued to remain very, very similar. In fact, the databases are still basically the same. And so consequently, um, Ancestral Quest will look the most like PATH. Therefore, by definition, I would say that it's probably the easiest for a PATH, long-time PATH user, to switch over to that. Well. Yeah. Well, uh, Ancestral Quest did not stay static at the time they did that. This was oh, seven or eight years ago. They continued to enhance it and add features and, and confusing things and fixing things and adding nice features to bells and whistles. So it's not going to be as simple, but it is, in my opinion, as, as simple as it can be. Under the circumstances. The, the last version of PATH is version 5.2.18. So the way to find out is that when you fire up PATH, up at the top, on the, there's a, a, uh, 
I think the, the logo says about path or something of that sort. It's the last icon at the, on that bar across the top. Click on that and that will tell you what the version number you're running. Well, I don't, can't download the well that's another point that I was going to make. Um, there are other sites that have the latest version of PATH available. Uh, for example, one of the most reputable sites is a, is a company called CNET. The letter C and then N-E-T, CNET.com. They're a very long time um, company that's been around that reviews software and provides access to unusual software and things of that sort. They're, they're based up in San Francisco and uh, they, they do a good job of it. They've been around for a long time. If you go to the internet and type in personal ancestral file, which is what PAP stands for, uh, the CNET site will come up as a place where you can download it. Yes? Okay. And once again, if you go to our trusty svcgg.org site, uh, there is a link that will take you to the CNET site where you can download it. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's why I, I hesitate to answer a question like that because. A lot of it depends upon my personal preferences, uh, but in any case, uh, it, unless the LDS Church Legal Department clamps down on these other sites that will provide it, and I can't understand why they would do something like that, it would be sad for them to, to make it so no one could access it again, but in any case, um, it's going to be available. I mean, I'll give it to you. I've got copies of it. Well, it'll when when you when you turn on when you uh, start up PATH, it the the opening logo says PATH 5.2, I think. Um, but there were you know the, the latest one is 5.2.18. That means there were 18 updates to it 10 years ago. So make sure you get the, the one eight because it'll have all the latest bug fixes and so on. Also, let me point out that there are at least two very, very active um, email lists on the internet where you can ask questions. So the fact that the LDS Church is not going to support PAP anymore is really a, 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 not a problem because their support was sort of dribbling off, and yet if you go to one of these websites, uh, one at RootsWeb and one at uh, Yahoo, you post a question and within minutes you'll have 18 answers. Most of which are good. <laughs> uh, a, yeah, they have a digest that you can go back through and look and see if, they, if uh, there are any if anyone has already asked that question, you'll get really good answers. Um, I, I answer those questions every once in a while. But. Well, I don't want to really call out the file, so that's Well, that's what I, I want to dispel that notion path is not going bye bye. It's just that. The LDS Church is not going to be the source of all of that information, or of that anymore. It's going to be others who do that. And I, I can guarantee you that there's going to be a lot of people who are not going to want to learn a new product. They're going to stick with PAP, they know it, they like it, it's adequate, um, and they don't need all the bells and whistles that the other products offer. Um, I still use it. When I, when I need something simple and easy to do and, and I know how it works and everything, I, I maintain my database, I, even though I don't use PATH as my primary source because I have clients and 
and family members who use other things, I have to use a different product. Whenever I want to do something that I really understand, I switch back to tab and do it that way. Brian. No, I don't. That's not the reason. Okay, Brian is referring to the fact that uh, because the databases, the Path and Ancestral Quest, are so are similar, that when they started out together, they had the same format. Now, Ancestral Quest has moved on and added new features, so they've added things into the database, but they maintained the original structure of the old Path file. So you literally can open up a Path database in or by using Ancestral Quest. Okay? So there's no problem with doing that if you if you choose to do that. But that's not the reason I want But people can do that. Okay, any other so so uh, there's plenty of support. You'll get extremely good support. Almost instantaneous. It's like those people sit out there and just wait to answer a question. And several days after the question's been answered, there's still people answering the question. So it's not an issue of not being able to find out information about that. It's just that the LDS Church has said, we've got other fish to fry. We'll let, we'll let what's, and what's developed over time go to work for it. <laughs> Believe it behind. Uh, Yahoo, and and there's one at Roots Web. Um, yeah, it's a users group. They call them users groups. So go into go into Yahoo or or Roots Web, and. They'll have, and, and type in users group, they'll have a link to users group, and you can search for the users group for PATH and sign up for it, and then all of a sudden you'll start getting all of these questions and answers. And sometimes, even though you don't have the question, you'll say, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Yes? About PATH? Okay, we will add to our svcgg.org, <laughs> uh, the ability to get to those, uh, those user groups. Remind me, Bill. As you can see from forgetting the newsletters and the projectors, I'm having trouble with. Okay. Now, back to family history moment. Is there anyone who had a an exciting discovery this past month that you'd like to share with us. It's summertime. Yes, ma'am. I actually have a Okay. Today, uh, here in the chapel, in this 
room here, I will be giving a class on the introduction to Irish research. Uh, this is a survey of, of uh, websites and, and what kinds of records are available and where to go look for them. And I'll show you some examples of what they look like and how to interpret them and, and so on. Uh, that class will be broadcast uh, over the internet through Google, what's it called? Hangouts. Google Hangout. So you can, uh, if you have your computers with you, you can actually, you might be able to see the screen better than what I have back here. Uh, in the Relief Society room, the RS room, which is down in that far corner of the building, is a class by Janet Brigham on digital image editing. Janet, would you explain what you're going to talk about? Does that include fixing great grandma's nose and uh, adding some hair to great grandpa and so on? <laughs> okay, Pam Brigham, who is Janet's cousin, um, in room 106, which is down the hall over here, we'll be giving a class on Mac Family Tree. Or for the Mac, so Pam, can you tell us what you're covering? Sourcing is the root of everything. You need to do that. So that if you're uh, struggling with that at all, you need to, to go to Debbie's class. That will be down the hall as well, next door to the Pam. Uh, we have renamed the Q&A class starting from today. It's now going to be Research with Leslie. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to capitalize on Leslie's fame as a great teacher. So from now on, the class called Research with Leslie uh, will be held in the Family History Center. Um, and if you have uh, you know, questions about research or uh, genealogy, that will be uh, there. Also, Carlene will be there uh, with a, the opportunity to just get a basic getting started in genealogy. And so those of you who are interested in either Research with Leslie or getting started, Go to the Family History Center, and then depending upon how many they have in the class, they'll split up from there, and, and one will go probably across the hall or something. But, so both of you will go to the Family History Center, which is in that far corner of the building on that side. But down the hall, just before you go out the doors to the outside, there's a hallway that goes off where the, the restrooms are. Go through that hallway and into the Family History Center. OK, are there any questions? Yes. Family search, family tree, or family search, just the, the research site. We can do that. Uh, they've changed that so dramatically uh, that people that are used to the old site may have lost it. <laughs> uh, so we can do that. Uh, Brian, where's Brian? Would you take note of that, please? So we need to schedule a class on familysearch.org. 
where uh, you can go to, to take advantage of all of the records that are being digitized and indexed by the LDS Church. Millions and millions of records that are coming online there and being stored. And some are being uh, indexed in a way that you can search them by name and dates and so on. Some are so new that they just digitized them and you have to go through the images one by one with what you're at. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's a major problem. When we complain about that, they say, oh, we're trying to find a way to get more younger people accessing it. And they, yeah, by confusing the old ones. <laughs> Somehow I don't get that connection. But confusing older people brings younger people. But somehow that seems to be the, the attitude that they have. <laughs> a question in the back, Betsy. They have been fussing around with the login process. Uh, in other words, if if you have more than one login, for example, in my case, because I teach classes, um, most of whom are not LDS, I maintain a non-LDS persona so that when I log in, what I see is the same thing my students see. But they keep canceling that on me. They, they see I've got all these registrations and these logins, and they just say, oh, he shouldn't, he doesn't need that many. Get rid of it. And so I'm constantly having to recreate my non LES persona. Yes, so I need to have this for the Well, when I've had problems, and I had problems as late as last night, I was trying to log in to get our indexing statistics, and they I had, to, I had to count to 10 and then <laughs> go have a drink and then <laughs> come back and finally I got in. But uh, there, there's just all kinds of things going on that they're playing So I would just be patient. I, but definitely you should call Salt Lake. Now, I want everybody to write down this number. It's the support number that you can get to just at, get answers to questions like this. It's one eight six six. That's the three. No, eight six six is the three pin. Then the rest of it, the phone number itself is four zero six one eight three zero, and that has significance to members of the Mormon Church. Four zero six being April six, eighteen thirty one eight. Is the, that's the date that the Mormon Church was organized. So all you have to do, the hard part is the 1866. And then the rest of it, just think, oh, you know, April 6, 1830. <laughs> you call, pardon? It gets you into the support service offered by FamilySearch.org. And there's a form tree, unfortunately, where you depending upon when you call. So if you call at midnight, you're going to get somebody in Australia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in, in many cases, there are Mormon missionaries who have been sent to Australia. So they speak English. Um, and, you know, they'll... Uh, some of them are actually working from home. So um, LDS people can become a missionary working from home, getting phone calls directly to them. And then you might have to explain your situation and they'll say, well, I don't know the answer to that. Let me bump me up a level and 
It's just like any phone tree here to support the community. It's just like any phone tree here to support the community. Studies. The Irish have never been known for being prodigious record keepers, due in large part to their long and vibrant oral tradition as well as their tubeless violent history. The Irish people, nonetheless, have generated a wealth of civic and ecclesiastical history, which in turn has resulted in many important primary and secondary source records for the historian and genealogist to use. So, what that boils down to is the fact that we're going to find ourselves running into a situation where there are not records that you can systematically analyze like you could say in England. Um, you know, you, you can go through the parish registers and there are, there, there's a hierarchy. You can either find the parish records themselves or you can go to the bishop's transcripts, then you can go to civil registration and so on. There's a, a much more uh, what I, the term I use is a systematic way that you can analyze and make sure that you cover the bases. Whereas when you're doing Irish research, you effectively have to be a lot more creative. You have to be willing to assemble information from a variety of sources that were not originally intended to be for uh, historical and genealogical purposes, but just happened to be because of other circumstances. A lot of it has to do with the fact that it's all oral. Uh, there's a rich, rich um, source of oral history from which Irish, uh, the more ancient Irish genealogy comes from. And uh, we can talk a little bit about that. But one of the reasons, uh, there's a book here that I've been reading called Saxons, Vikings, and Celts um, that kind of explains why that really took place. Why is it that the uh, that the Irish are not, their records are not quite as organized as we would like them to be. It effectively is a, a chapter here where it talks about the fact that Ireland was blessed by the fact that the Romans never invaded. They came close. They actually, the, the Roman general who was over in England at the time, uh, brought his army up to the coast and was planning to sail across the Irish Sea and go in and Invade Ireland and take over. But uh, he got some false information, realized that maybe it wouldn't be a good idea, and he never did. And so Ireland was never blessed with the. the and so this lucky escape was that there were, are no written histories of Ireland from the Roman period. Not until the arrival of early Christians in the 5th century AD, and of St. Patrick in particular, did written accounts, however unreliable, begin to appear. St. Patrick himself is claimed, is credited with the authorship of the earliest documents in Irish history, written in Latin, the Confessions, which defines and defends his mission, and one other, a short letter excommunicating the soldiers of a British chieftain who had murdered some of Patrick's convicts. So effectively, the, the historical tradition of writing things down and uh, creating a history that we could use for genealogical research was missing, simply because there were no Romans in there uh, having the impact on, on the country like they did with other places where they did. So anyway, that's it. So as it's always the case when I'm teaching a, an introductory class on research in a particular area, I always recommend that it is important to have a brief genealogical history of the country so that you know how to make intelligent decisions about where to look and what to look for and what to expect to find. So I've assembled with, in this handout that I've given you uh, a brief genealogical history of Ireland in which I have put in some major historical events that sort of define the overall history of, of uh, Ireland and then seeded it with important things that have to do with uh, how to look at the history from a genealogical historical point of view. So uh, I started way back, but there's something called the, the Milesian genealogy, where people were trained, they called them piads, pilads, and they were, their, their responsibility was using a memory help 
painting and memorize the source history, the genealogies of any of Ireland. And that was a that was a, a thing that was passed down from generation to generation among the few until they no longer became necessary. So there were people who were specifically assigned to memorize that history. Then uh, over time there were people who, who came in and started to write that down. But anyway, there's there's certain things that you can see through here. I've also included cases where there were plagues and the catastrophes, because most of us have this notion that the potato bite flight was the, was the first catastrophe in the country that they had. And that's not the case. They had lots of plagues and, and uh, droughts and things of that sort. They caused havoc among the, the Irish even before the potato family. Um, Ireland was sort of subsumed as part of uh, the British Empire. You can see the Henry the, the, uh, the Second uh, in 1171 lands in, in Ireland and, and declares himself Lord of Ireland. Uh, then there was for Henry the Eighth who set up uh, the Church of Ireland. Um, uh, in 1536, the Church of Ireland was responsible for proving wills until 1858. Uh, most of those were, were destroyed in the fire that we talked about in the evening. Uh, this Fitzgerald fellow in 1537 was one of the first to try to break away from England and failed and was hanged for it, drawn in quarters and, and so on. Um, but then they, they have a very violent and, and uh, very prodigious history that, that took place. Um, but uh, uh, in, in 1609, the plantation of Ulster in Northern Ireland was, uh, was established on a large scale by the Scottish Presbyterians. And this is largely a result of what was called the Highland Clearance, uh, the sad part of the history of the United Kingdom. Uh, but effectively, what it meant is that uh, plantation owners in the highlands of Scotland came to the conclusion that it was going to be much more productive financially, much more uh, economically productive for them to put sheep on their land rather than a different farm. And so they drove all of the farmers, the poor farmers that were working the land, they just drove them off, sent them back. Uh, most of them went down to the lowlands in Scotland, where it was all gravelly and, and rocky and different farms. They eventually ended up over in Ireland in the Ulster plantation, and they were known as the South Irish, or the Ulster Irish. And the, the Presbyterians, in that time, the large landowners, they had the right to choose who they wanted to be their church leader, the Presbyterian church leaders. And so the Presbyterian church leaders were beholden to the plantation. So they did not oppose this horrible thing driving the poor farmers off the land. And so the Presbyterian Church was uh, uh, defying a lot of that, and so the British government supported it as well, because they wanted to make the confidence that they actually did it yet. Um, things of that sort of took place. Um, conflict between England and Ireland took place. The Catholics were, were badly persecuted for a long time. Uh, you had to be a member of the Church of England or the Church of Ireland to uh, be, be able to own property or be a citizen, or uh, you couldn't uh, have your kids baptized in, in the Church of the Church of Ireland and so on. So there was that conflict that goes way, way back. Uh, in 1649, you can see that the earliest known newspapers began a publication. Uh, there was in 1654 uh, a civil survey that the landowners in 1640. More problem came in to all the land on the land that belonged to the Catholics and redistributed to all of his supporters. And so there was a survey that was taken before and after so that they could keep track of, of uh, who owned what property. Uh, so those records became useful to us. Um, there were lots of uh, tax rolls that did not know the names. Uh, both the county records are available to that. And so many of the best records that we have in the Irish uh, record collection are taxable. Which unfortunately don't list anybody but the heads of household. Now it's 
um, for births and deaths, but uh, the marriages for a long time remained, uh, uh, had to be done in a central location and until the civil registration process became effective, uh, that had to be done in the, in the established churches. Um, so you can see in 1845, civil registration begins, but even then, uh, they uh, didn't allow the uh, non non Church of Ireland people to have their marriages. It wasn't until 1864 when the non Church of Ireland people were allowed to be uh, included in the civil registration, which included the Roman Catholics. So, Roman Catholics were non Irish Church. That's right. Roman Catholics. <laughs> No, they were a minority. But, uh, Cromwell came in and drove a lot of them out, uh, took all the property away from them, and gave it to the, the people that were his followers who were the Church of Ireland. Uh, so for many, many years, the Catholics were basically uh, kept underground. They made many of them sign an oath of allegiance. So there, you will find in some cases where uh, Roman Catholics who were who were not willing to, um, who were not willing to give up their property or give up their rights to uh, citizenship and things like that, they would sign an oath of allegiance to the Church of Ireland. In other words, renounce the Pope, which is effectively what it was, and uh, then they would be able to continue to own their property and so on. Um, it wasn't until many years afterwards that they that the Catholics were allowed to. To uh, maintain their, their uh, church. That wasn't until about 18, in the early parts of 1860s, when the Toleration Acts and the, the government began to ease up on that persecution. And then, starting in the 1900s, we have the, uh, the Irish Free State that was created in 1921. So, the, the uh, southern part of Ireland is the Republic of Ireland, or what was called the Free State, uh, versus uh, Northern Ireland. And right immediately afterward, there was a civil war uh, that, uh, that sort of left Irish society divided for many, many generations. Now, during that civil war in 1922, um, the opposing forces went in and literally dynamited, blew apart the, the court, the record, the place called the Four Courts, where the public records office were. So, in 1922, a large portion of all of the census records that have been taken and church records that have been put there were all destroyed. Furthermore, because paper was so expensive and so difficult to come by in Ireland, um, the government literally ordered many of those old census records to be destroyed, chopped up, made into pulp, and made into new paper so that they could hold another census and keep other records. So as a result of that, the only censuses available in Ireland, the official censuses, is the 1901 and the 1911 census. The others just don't exist. And that's really sad. That's what makes it really hard for us. OK? So let's just give you a rough idea of, of the history of Ireland and uh, so when you're looking for something, you might want to just peruse through that and find out what was going on in that time frame. It will give you an idea of whether uh, religious uh, tolerance had been involved and it, it, it would be available for you to find the records that you need. And of course, you, you need to take into account which records were destroyed by the, uh, during the Civil War in 1922. There were a lot of church records that had not yet been brought into the public record. So you will find church records. In fact, there's a book called Irish Church Records by James Ryan that I find very useful when looking and trying to understand church records and how to find out where they are and uh, so on. Okay, here's a picture of the Fort Courts building that was on fire, dynamited pretty badly. Most of those records were all destroyed. They, they primarily did not want to have any history of, of, the, uh, of their religion left for anybody to use against them in the future. Okay, 
So one of the first things to give you an idea of where to start looking for various record collections that you might want to find, uh, if you go to Ancestry.com, if you have a membership or if you can go to a public library or go to a family history center where you can access Ancestry, uh, it's useful for you to go in and go to the card catalog. So you just navigate to their card catalog and put in the title, Ireland. And hit search, and it'll tell you that there are 128 collections. You can see up there of item of record collections at Ancestry.com that have Ireland in the title. So that's not a you know that's not a shoddy uh, number of collections. Uh, here's civil registration, marriage index. Here's the births and baptisms, some church records. Here's more. Here's the civil. Um, those are marriages, here's births, here's deaths. There's something called Griffith's valuation. We'll talk a little bit about that. Those are taxes. Um, uh, here's masters and babies, or ship school records, and so on. So you'll just you'll be able to find a long and lengthy list of this is 128 different record collections that you can pour through and uh, see if they contain anything. But one of the problems is, is that you won't be able to do it quite as systematically as you would. You, know, you have to sort of look through them all and just try them out. See if by chance your family left a paper trail in one of those places. And you'll be surprised. For example, in a tax record, it's not always the owner of the property, but it's the occupant of the property. So it wouldn't be that just wealthy people who would be in the record, because the farmer who worked on the farm, who was the occupant of the farm, would be listed. And so a, a less than upper class people would be listed there. Okay. And it goes on down to, uh, you can actually get some important surveys, and I can show you a picture of one of those uh, later on at the end of the class. Um, here is a Religious census taken in 1766. It only has 11,000 names in it, but you know, 11,000 is better than zero, and, and you just need to take the time to go through and see what's there. Okay. Here's some more. Um, Tom's directory. Here's some newspapers. Here's the Famine Relief Commission papers. Here's births extinct and dormant baronies of Ireland, England, Ireland, and Scotland, and so on. There's all kinds of unusual records that, you, that have been made available to us online uh, through the efforts of Ancestry.com. Okay? Um, you can uh, go ahead, for example, let's, let's go to the births of baptism. These are, uh, in, in, this is an index of names extracted from births registered in Ireland. And uh, you can actually do the search. Uh, here's, uh, yes? They, they literally put them together. I mean, this is, these records are, are prior to the Civil War, to the 1922. And this goes back to 1845, when there wasn't the division. Okay. So these. Database, these collections will have records across the north and the south. There's marriage index. There's the death index. They're all searchable. But remember, they're just an index. So, in, in, in a similar fashion to the way England did it, um, they, they index them by quarters. And, uh, and the family had 90 days to register a birth or a marriage or a death, which is another quarter. So the date that you find in the index could be up to six months off from the actual date. So the index doesn't necessarily represent a source of information for your family history. You want to be able to get the, the actual certificate to find the actual date and to verify that that's really the person that you're looking for in your family. 
Uh, in the index, you'll see the name of the person, for example, um, say a birth or a death, but you won't see the father or the mother or any family. To give you an example, just recently, I was looking for a um, the registration, the death information for a child in my family uh, in England that had died young. And I could find an entry in the civil registration for that child but with that name um, that matched the approximate time that I knew that the child had died. Unfortunately, there were four of them. And so I literally had to order four registration certificates to figure out which one was my ancestor. And I got four letters in the, in the mail and um, opened it. And unfortunately, they don't batch them together into one envelope. They sent each, each order in a separate envelope. So I had four envelopes. I opened the first one, and it was the, the right name of the child, but the father's name was wrong. So I spent $15 for a certificate that was useless to me, the wrong father. Opened the second envelope, same thing, the wrong father. I opened the third one, bingo, I had the right father. So I had answered my question. He lived for six months and died, and I had the exact birth date, and, and you know, everything was right. But I had this fourth letter, fourth envelope that I had opened. And it turned out to be the right father as well. And it turned out that this child, with the same name, was born after the one that had died after six months. And he only lived a half an hour. But that was a revelation to me that, that, you know, that they tried to have another child and named it that same name. He only lived for half an hour. But it was, you know, it took getting those certificates before I discovered that interesting little tidbit in my family history. Expensive, but what? Okay, so here are some, we're going to start going through some of the sites that I think are very useful for uh, looking for records. The first one is the National Archives. So we go to www.nationalarchives.ie for Ireland. And this is what their homepage looks like. Now I don't know about you, but my Irish is not very so if it comes up like this, you can't read it at all. There's a little button up here at the top that says English or Gaelic. All you have to do is click on English, and it's immediately translated into English. Anyone here who can speak Gaelic or read quite Gaelic? <laughs> Now, very much like many of the National Archives, ours included, they cater to a broader audience than just genealogists. So they'll have their website designed for people who are going there for to, to write a school paper or teachers who want to prepare a class lesson, or people who are historians, or they'll, want to, they'll have a site for people that want to search the archives, or they'll have people that want to search the family tree. So in this particular instance, it's fairly obvious that we want to click on that window right there that says research your family tree. So if you do that, you'll come up with an introduction to genealogy. They assume that everybody's starting from the beginning. But over on the left-hand side, you can see that there's a variety of different um, options you can choose. The first being genealogy records. That's what we're here for. We'd like to see what records are available. Um, a lot of their site is oriented around people coming there, because the majority of the people that go there are probably going to be people living in Ireland, and so they would like to come to Dublin to see the but for those of us that can't, uh, this is what we're, we're going to have to do. So if we click on the genealogy record site, they have a list over here on the left-hand side of various records that uh, you can see. Like census returns, the tithe of Potman books, and the Griffiths valuation, the wills and testamentary records, and other things. Ireland, Australia, transfer 
transportation records. It wasn't yeah. just England that transported the criminals to, uh, to Australia. The Irish did it as well. There are records uh, and so on. So let's look at the census return to the end. Okay. So as I indicated earlier, only the 1901 and the 1911 census has been digitized and made available. And they've got a lot of feedback here, a lot of information that you can uh, read about those censuses. But the, in order to get to them, there's a tiny little word that says they are available free online. And you'll notice that online is a slightly different color. It's a bluish color. And that's the link that gets you to access the record. You have to look at it carefully to find that link. And if, you, if you miss it, uh, you won't find it anywhere else. That's the only link that you can get to online access. Once you get there, they have another page that explains more in detail about the census record and uh, uh, places where you can go, what's in the records, uh, who are involved in the project and digitizing them, uh, where, where you can get feedback if you find a mistake in the indexing, you can get feedback and you can go and so on. But right there, there's an entry that says, search the census records for Ireland 1901 and When you go there, they give you a search option. And the first, at the top, they default to 1911, but if you click that little arrow just to the right of 1911, they give you the option to go into 1901. You can put in the surname and the forename if you have it. You can select what county if you already know, and you can even get down to certain details like the town or the street address or the DED. You can put in age plus or minus five or five years, and you can indicate whether you want to search both sexes or one or the other. Okay? Now, I'm sure you're all wondering what the heck is DED. I anticipated that because I didn't know what it was. It stands for District Electoral Divisions. So these are the enumeration districts that they use. And if you know anything about the region in the town where your family came from, you know, something like maybe a major street or a little rural area that is divided, you can put that in that box and it will come up with it. So uh, the other point that they make here is that this search engine has not been developed to the sophistication of being able to search for variations on standard names. They haven't gone that far yet. They, they're not sophisticated enough to use a, a Google search or a sound search. So they make the point here that you have to, uh, we have not corrected spelling. Some names are illegible and so on. So you may have to try a number of strategies to find the search because you can see. And they offer some help with, with the Irish for you. So let's, uh, let's just try an example. I put in the name William Rankin, whose age was approximately 45 years old, plus or minus five years. And I, I have no clue where he's from. He's in my ancestry, but it just shows up in one of the, one of the, I of the uh, Canadian censuses as being from Ireland. So I have no clue. So I put in William Rankin, and I ended up with 14 hits. You can see right up here. It shows the first 10 of those 14 hits. Surname, forename, Townland Street, the DEP. So they're giving the census wards or uh, certain areas within the, the, the county is over here. His age and his sex. And now also they have a box up. Now that's not all of the information in the census. There's more information. So if you would like to see that, there's a box up here that says show all information. So if you click that box, it goes on and it spreads out and it picks up the other places, such as birthplace, occupation, their religion. Remember that early on there's still a lot of religious persecution, and so they track what religion people what language they spoke, what the relationship to the head of household was, uh, their marital status, and if they had any specific illnesses. Yes? These records, 
will not include Ulster. The question is, will these records and these censuses include the Northern Ireland and these? Um, you know, I'm not 100% sure of that, but I believe that they don't. For the, the, the other censuses, you'll have to go somewhere else. I could be wrong. Okay. So let's let's just presume I, I I have no idea how to identify my William Rankin because I don't know what where he came from. <coughs> I don't know what his occupation was. He was a farmer when he got to Canada. But that you know they were all they, they all became farmers when they got to Canada. So that didn't help out. But just for the sake of, of showing you what a record would look like, you can see over here that the, the name, the surname and the forename are links. They'll both take you to the same site, which is a more detailed page about that family. So here's William Rankin. He's the head of the household. He's 40 years old. And his wife is listed down here at page 35. They're all from the Church of Ireland. And then we've got two sons and two daughters. Now, they, for some reason, they put them in a random order. And I have yet to figure out why they don't show up in the order. No. No, they're not alphabetical. There's David down here, the back in the top. <laughs> Looks random to me. I I studied it and tried to figure out. Um, you know, and it can't be by sex. It can't be by age. It can't be by relationship to the head of the household. Whatever. It's just beyond that. Something like that. Some combination of it. Okay. Now you'll notice down below here, they also have access to other images relating to this particular kid. For example, I can actually go and see the household return. It's called Form A. So what we have here is a case where a form, a, a census form, that had several pages associated with it, and that was dropped off at the house in the morning. The enumerator would come back later on and pick it up, and then transfer the information from that household form, the return, they called it, into the enumeration book. Okay? So, and that, that was the same case for British censuses in this time frame as well. Now, you can actually go look at that household return by clicking on that, and this is what that looks like. So here is the Form A that was filled out and signed by a member of the household who filled it out. So first of all, I have William Rankin's signature. So if I were, if I happen to be able to find William, my William Rankin's mm -hmm. signature somewhere in the Canadian records, I could then come back and look through these records one at a time and find one that matches. That would be one way to come close to finding a record that I need. But you can see here, this is the order. So William, he's the head of household, he put his name first, and he put his wife next, and then the sons and the daughters. So for some reason, they didn't show up in the actual index that same way. But you can you can actually go back in and see whether the indexer did the right, you know, actually got the right thing, did it correctly, got the ages right, or got the spelling of the names correctly, or the relationships correct, or something of that sort. Okay. Now going back to the previous screen, there's an additional page. If you click on page two down here, it's nothing more than the instructions that went along with the booklet that was given to the household on how to fill it out. So if you have questions about what things meant, then you can go to page two here, and you have to blow it up quite big because it's you know it's number it's number eight point print and type set, so you have to be able to blow it up quite big to see it. But uh, you can actually get the census images that are available. Now these other images down here are abstracts that were taken by the enumerator who tallied up all the people on a particular enumeration. How many 
males, how many females, how many males over 16 when you go into the military. Those are just tallies, they're not individual information about the person. But you might be able to find out something about the place they were living in, the house, the building, how many people, other people lived in that building, or things of that sort. If it was out in the rural area, you could find out something about the farm information. So there's a lot of information there that, that is, is beyond just the, uh, the population schedule there. Okay, moving on. The next one that's fairly important is the tie the Plotman books and, and Griffith's valuation. The problem was in Ireland that they needed a way to pay the, the priest run the church, church of Ireland. So they tied, they assigned, they allocated tithing or taxes to collect from everybody. And so these tithing books have survived. And so effectively what they are, they were compiled between 1823 and 1837 in order to determine how much tax everybody had to pay in order for the church to be able to run its operation. Um, so effectively, and, and really, first of all, it caused a lot of consternation among those who were not members of the Church of Ireland because they were being taxed to run a church that they didn't belong to. So they were not popular, uh, but in any case, most of them were, uh, there were those who defaulted, uh, and they were on a separate list, and they were persecuted for having done so, but uh, some of them were willing to do that. Uh, and in fact, though, that when you click on this, this section that calls the title of the problem book, you're going to get a page that gives you the, the uh, explanation of how it was done, and how it took place, and so on. But you can, you can click up here where it says click here to search, you can go and search there, or you can browse them. So you can go and look at them page by page, looking for an ancestor if you, if you wish. Um, effectively, this is what a uh, what many of these kind of plotting books look like. Um, so you can see there, the, there's the townland of where this place was. This is Black Hill. And here's the name of the occupiers. And then here's a place called Bowley and the occupiers there. And then, as you can see, there's columns here. These are, the, this is first class, second class, third class, fourth class, and then a gross amount of acres. And then here's a listing of all the, the, the taxes that they were allocated. Um, the reason for the, the columns here is that the tax rate vary depending upon the productivity or the quality of the land. So if there was really productive, good, high quality soil, it was taxed at a higher rate than the, the rocky land that was less. And in fact, there was some land that wasn't taxed at all because of basically the swamp land or the solid rocks or, or whatever, and they couldn't plant on it at all. So the first class land had the highest tax rate and, and so on. So in some cases they didn't do it by, they didn't classify them by classes like that. They just indicated what the tax rate was for each plot of land. And they would be given to what rate, how many uh, shillings or tens of pounds per acre that they would select that. Question? The church, I heard it's a Presbyterian and then the Roman Catholic. Well, the Presbyterians were separate from the Church of Ireland. The Church of Ireland was basically the Anglican Church. Church of England. Although they they were never admitted. Yeah, you want to be careful talking to a, a guy in the little Irishman about it being the same as the Church of England. So you can see here is a column. Uh, the ARP does not stand for actual retailers' price as we call it today. Uh, they were divided into units of ARP or acres, rods, and perches. So there were 40 perches to a rod, and four rods to an acre, and then the pounds were pounds, shillings, and pence. You can see the rates over here, the, the British pound sign, the P for pence, and D for pence. That's, that's 
That's the way the British have always done it. They use the V as an abbreviation for the F. In fact, came from an old uh, Roman word, which is Rachna. Okay, so that's that's essentially the major part of the the uh, uh, National Archives. Those are the two major ones that you want to do. There, there's also mentioned on here. If we go back a little bit. There's also Griffiths, the primary Griffiths valuation. Uh, if you go to that and click on it and you want to get to it, it'll take you to a new site. So from the National Archives, if you click on going to Griffiths valuation, it takes you to this site called askaboutireland.ie slash Griffiths valuation. And this is where you can find this Griffiths valuation, which was a full scale valuation of all of the land in Ireland. And the, the minister who was selected by the, the I think it was the Queen at that time, uh, was the name by the, the fellow by the name of Richard Griffith. And he was responsible for running this evaluation process. And then he published the books between 1847 and 1860. This is the most thorough taxation of Ireland. So this is where, uh, beyond a certain point, 1847, where you want to uh, look at this information. So effectively, they make it very simple. You can put in a family name. Uh, you can include similar names if you want. Then you can either put in a first name, or a county, or you know, even more. And then you can fill in the search. So I'm going to look for uh, the Kirkwood family who were associated with the Rankin family. And I know that he was from Antrim, from Belfast. So I'm going to look in for all of the Kirkwoods or something similar to Kirkwood in the county of Antrim. So I clicked search, and I ended up with this. I ended up with 63 hits, all in the county of Antrim, which are parishes surrounding Belfast. There's all sorts of them here. And I, on this page, I get the first 20 of them. And then there's a button where you can click and go next and so on. And you notice that out here, there are some links that I can, I can uh, go in and look at. So if I want to look at the details, so let's pick one of them. Uh, I think I picked William Kirkwood from, uh, from Bal Valley Creighton. This is the details. Uh, down is an Antrim, a lower Antrim, and a, a union called Ballavina, a parish called Ballaclu, and a town called Ballacreeky. And it was 1862 when this was evaluated, and uh, it's on sheet number 37 and 38 in the maps, taxation maps. Okay? Yeah, and these, these, these are the, the uh, taxation maps. Before 1922. Okay, so then if I click on, let's go back again. If I click on the original page right here, this is what I get. This is the page of that taxation roll that contains all of the people in that area. You see down here, Valley Creek, and he shows up down here as William Kirkland, somewhere way down in here. Right there, William Kirkland. And here's all the details about his, the amount he was taxed and what kind of property he had and so on. So you can see down here, you can push on the plus key to make it bigger, you can read it in more detail and so on. So if you're interested in finding out uh, what kind of land he had, whether it was high tax or low tax or things of that sort, or who his neighbors were, you can just go here. You can also click on a, a thing there on that more first page that takes you to a map. And first of all, it starts out with the whole region area. So over here on the upper left hand corner, you can see that, that you can zoom in on it. So if I zoom in, you can see it gets down to the very detail of where that was. Unfortunately, they don't write the names in those areas. That would have been a very tedious process. But you can see that um, it's across two pages. Remember that first page we got through had two page numbers? So you can see that they they stitch together those two page numbers, not perfectly here. 
it's a little bit off, but this is Valley Creek, and somewhere in this area is where William Kirkwood had his property. And you can see that they've written the taxation uh, levels on pieces of property here in that on that particular map on this page. This page they hadn't done it yet, but over here is where they can see what the taxation rate is by area. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, there's another site that's the equivalent of the public record office of the National Archives for Northern Ireland. It's called Crony. Public Record Office, Northern Ireland, E R O N I. So this is the National Archives for Northern Ireland. Once again, it's got the you know the, the search local and family history. Do their exhibitions, uh, they have talks, events going on. So you would pick the, the part that actually shows family history. Once again, it's gonna, you're going to have to drill down through their introductory stuff to get to the stuff that you're looking for. Or it would be very useful for you if you're just getting started to read some of these sites that they have. You know, what's new in the archives, how to search the archives, what family history is to them, and, and so on. Uh, what, what's, uh, what's available online. When you click on researching the records link, uh, here are the details that give you research and records held, uh, records held in Crony, records not held in Crony. Those are always really useful sites. Um, uh, the National Archives of England has finally added some of that to their site because a lot of people thought that they could go to the National Archives, for example, to find civil registration records. And they got tired of people saying, where are your civil registration records? I can't find them. So they put up a link on their page for civil registration records, and the first thing you get is, we do not hold them here. <laughs> so consequently, it's a good idea to look at the records not held in front so that you know that you, they usually tell you where you have to look to find them, which is a very helpful thing. They don't just say, we don't have them. They say, go here. And that's where you find them. And that's helpful. Okay? So that's the, one of the things that you like. Using the archive, they always have something visiting. What, what, how do you get there? What do you do when you get there? Um, and so on. Um, Janet and I are going to Ireland in November. But I don't know if we're going to go to Tony. But in any case, there are family history sites, there's local history sites. Uh, and other things there that you would want to look at. So when you click on search the archives, they've got it divided down into major categories, uh, such as their electronic catalog, they've got a freeholders list, people who own their own property, they've got uh, uh, images, uh, you know, family pictures, and so on. Here's uh, what wills they have. We'll look at some of those, uh, and so on. There's a Category here, street directories, um, corporation records. Here's the name search. So if you go to the name search, uh, they give you a little introduction here. Um, if you're reading over here, you're looking for the place that you click on, you actually do a search. It's over here. In the far right, so you can go click on search for names, and that'll give you their search engine. Okay. So if you type in the name, uh, you've got a choice of putting in a four name as well. If you know a location, you can put that in. You can say match all words or match any of them, any one of them, or a match a phrase in the location site. So consequently, what that means is, is that if you type in a description of a place, if you have this selected, it'll require that all of those words be on the page that it returns to you. Or if you have several sites, several counties or whatever, you would click on this one, and it will match on any one of those words independently. Or if you want that particular phrase, then you would click on this particular one. Okay. And then you can, you can select which, which things that they have available in their name search, and you can select the more than 10, and that was, I think, 15 names per bit. You can sort them by surname or by uh, chronologically and so on. You click the search button, 
and uh, that would give you the results. So I put in Alexander Kirkwood here uh, and see what I would come up with. And I got two hits, one in Belfast itself and one in Coltra, which is outside of Belfast. Okay, they're in a collection called Pre-1858 Wills and Admonds. A little brief explanation of what that, why 1858 and what is an admon. 1858 is the year that they took the proving of wills away from the church, both in England and in Ireland, Scotland. Prior to 1858, the church was responsible for proving everybody's will. So when you died and had a will, your will would be taken before a archdeacon or a bishop or someone whoever was responsible for that, um, that area, and they would then go through the process of proving whether that will was valid, and then the administration, which is what Admon says for here, is the administration of that will, which is where the executor of the will supplies to the court an explanation of how he or she administered the will, and the court decides whether that is what the will was wanting, what the church was wanting to have in the first place. Okay, so this is pre 1858, meaning that this would be from a an ecclesiastical probate court. Yes? Did they have passport applications? I haven't seen any passport applications, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. I haven't been looking for them, so they might be there. I would go into the catalogs and see if you can find Irish passport, or even do a Google search or a big search for well, to search for something like that. Irish passport. There may be some Irish immigration society that has gone into the records and dug them out and put them up on the online on one of their own sites. I'll get to that in a minute. Now over here on the right hand side it says view. Don't get excited that all of a sudden when you put that, there's going to be a, a will appearing on your screen. In fact, I haven't found one yet. It comes back and it gives you the index information for that will. And all that this tells me that I didn't already know was that it was approved in 1839. It doesn't give me a death date. It only tells me that this will was approved in 1839. Which could be years after the person died. <clears throat> Because some people put in their wills that um, I leave 50 pounds to my infant daughter when she turns 21. So the will isn't officially closed and approved until the infant daughter turns 21. And the administrator goes in, provides a letter of administration to the court saying, I gave 50 pounds to so-and-so, and then there will be a receipt from so-and-so saying, I received 50 pounds from the estate of my late father, so-and-so. Then it's closed. And so that date could be however, no. <laughs> it's not very helpful in most cases. It gives you a, an ending date, but it doesn't give you the actual. Yeah, I died before that. Okay. And I have yet, in my searches, I have yet to find a will that's available. Actually, available. Now, down here, that's a great question. Down here at the bottom, it says the original documents referred to in this case do not exist. No further information other than that recorded above has survived. So it was from some index that was the, of wills. It was in a calendar, a court calendar of some sort, but the will itself was probably destroyed at four courts in 1922. Now sometimes I have found where it says they exist, but I'll be darned if they tell you where to go. 
is probably a Tony. Now, if we, if we go back, back to the Tony homepage right here, you notice that you can see here's a list of will calendars, an index of wills. That's probably where this is all coming from. And it says it contains digitized images up to the 1900. Yeah. But not all of them. You know, some of them are not, many of them are not digitized. Okay. So that's Chrome. Um, another site that you find in the certificate, in the civil registration records, the registration of a birth or a marriage or a death. This would be after 1845 for Church of Ireland and after 1864 for everybody else. You can order those certificates from the hsc.ie, which is Health Services, something rather, for Ireland. This is where you go to order the certificate for those registrations that you found in the index. So when you, first of all, you have to register. No, no, I take it back. I, that's the British side. In the Irish side, they don't require that you register. They require that you fill out your name and address and phone number and email address every time you place an order. Okay, and you have to accept the terms and conditions. And then at the bottom of the screen, you have to indicate whether you're, you're requesting a birth certificate, a marriage certificate, or a death certificate. And then you click go, and it takes you to a screen where you fill in the information about that person. Now, you don't necessarily have to have found them in an index, but it would be a good idea to do that because if you don't know that they're there, you're going to spend money that you, that you don't have. I mean, the, for something that doesn't exist. So you would fill in the name of the person, the date of the, that the birth occurred, which you can get off of the indexes, the place where it took place, the gender, and if you know the fathers, and you won't know that. This is a screen, uh, this is a place, place where people who are living can go and get a copy of their birth certificate, or their marriage certificate, or their death certificate of somebody that they know. Not necessarily a genealogist going back to trying to find answers. So they've got places to put things in that wouldn't apply to you. So in this case, you would probably leave it blank. Put in the number of certificates required, and you submit that. It then takes you, I, I didn't put in before, I put in my credit card and number and all that sort of thing. So then it'll ask you for your money. And they're more expensive than the British certificates. The British certificates are cost, they cost about nine. Pounds, 25 pence, these are 20 pounds, which is probably $25. So they're more expensive. Okay, Family Search is another place where you can go to find information about Irish record collection. So if you go to the FamilySearch.org search site and click on search, and select the United Kingdom and Ireland portion of that. And then when that comes up, you can go in and select on Ireland. You can see that they have seven collections that they have digitized. That means that they've taken records that they had in their microfilm collection that they, that they photographed many years ago. They have now converted those to digital images and on top of that, because you can see the record numbers here, they've actually indexed them and made them searchable by name and place and so on. So all of these records here are all searchable, and the last three actually have images of the original document. These are all indexed. So here they combine, whereas in Ancestry.com, they kept the marriage birth and death index is separate, the LDS church has gone in and combined them all into one index. So 23 million records in there. So this gives you the date that they were last updated. But in any case, you can go in and click on one of those 
and do a search. So here's the civil registration. You can come in and put in a name, a last name, either a birth, marriage, residence, death, or some other place. You can do that. And for example, in this case, I put in Sarah Jane, or, yeah, put in Sarah Jane Reed from Antrim, and I ended up with two hits, both of the same record. Uh, somebody thought that the, well, I'm not sure if they're two hits. I just noticed that one is Sarah Jane and the other is Sarah Ann. But I was looking for Sarah Jane. So if I click on that, here is the index information. For birth, uh, here's the registration quarter that she was registered in. They just said 1869, so they didn't even tell you what quarter. Here is the microfilm number that it found on, but this is nothing more than the original index itself. So it still doesn't give you the certificate that you can get. You would still have to go back to that previous site that I just showed you and order the certificate to find out who Sarah Jane Reed's parents are and when she was exactly the exact date of her birth, which could have been 1868. Is this the registration here? Okay, a couple of last of, of sites just quickly before we go. There's one called irishorigins.com that you can go to, and it has a variety of censuses. And it has some of those same ones that, that you found in the National Archives, but you can search using their search engine. So it's called irishorigins.com, uh, but it's a subscription site, and you can either get the whole thing or you can get British origins and national wills, or you can do just Irish origin. It's a little expensive, I thought, so I didn't subscribe. Here's a new one that I just found out about this week because I have a, a student of mine who is in Ireland right now. He emailed back and said there's a new site that's coming online. You might be interested in it. So I'm sharing it with you here just out of interest. It's called IrelandXO.com. And it really means Ireland reaching out. Pardon? No, it's free. You can donate there if you want, but it's a free site. It's primarily oriented around people who live in Ireland, so it's focused around parishes, around, not parishes, well it is about parishes, but uh, counties. But if you click over here on the right hand side where it says reconnect, it gives you a choice of where do I start, I can start with a group, parish, a parish group, or a county, or if I don't know where in Ireland, you can click here and post a message and say, uh, I have ancestors from such and such a place with this name, can anybody help me? It's a way of communicating your research needs, and theoretically, it's brand new. So uh, I haven't seen long lists of, of postings on it yet, but um, this is something where you can find out more information. Hot off the press. One book that I recommend if you really need lots of help is a book called Tracing Your Irish Ancestors by John Brennan. He just came out with his fourth edition, which we picked up at a, at a book selling place at a, at a conference. But when I went online to see how much it costs, it's 3605, but there were only 11 in stock before on the way. But it's a very good book, particularly, particularly in the back, the big portion of it here is the back. From here on, so you can see a good section of it in the back, has a list of all of the church records in Ireland, where they are, what, what years are covered, and so on. So all of this is for the entire country, all of the church records are available. Okay. The last name is, uh, his name is John Brennan. G. The previous one, IrelandXO.com. Okay, questions? John, what was his last name? It's John Brennan, G R E N H A N. Anybody else? 
This is Richard Brand signing off from Santa Clara, California.